Hello everyone and I welcome you all to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on device corrections and removals. My name is Michael and I'll be your host for today's session. And on behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you all for being part of today's session. Uh, today's webinar is being presented by Dan O'Leary. A few words about Dan, ladies and gentlemen, before we start off today's session. Dan's the president of Ombu Enterprises LLC, which is a company offering training and execution in operational excellence, focused on analytic skills and also a systems approach to operations management. And Dan has had more than 30 years of experience in quality operations and program management in regulated industries including aviation, defense, medical devices, and clinical labs. And he has a master's degree in mathematics and also is an ASQ certified biomedical auditor, a quality auditor, quality engineer, reliability engineer, and also a Six Sigma black belt as well. And he's certified by APICS in resource management. And we are honored to have Dan with us today to present today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, I just want to quickly outline today's program. This webinar is for a 90-minute duration. First, Dan will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that he would cover, and then share with you his presentation. And also would like to inform all our participants present that once part of today's teleconference, we've been placed on mute and would remain so until the Q&A begins. You have over 10 minutes at the end for your question and answers. But if you do come up with questions during the session, ladies and gentlemen, please post your questions in the Q&A panel or the chat messenger. And for any reason, if you do get logged out of today's session, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we're all ready, I request Dan to take it from you. Dan? Well, thank you very much, and welcome, everybody, to our presentation today on uh, device corrections and removals. Now, um, what you'll see is that um, every slide, except apparently this first one, um, has a slide number. And so if you have a question about a particular slide, um, note down the slide number, and uh, I can go back and uh, get the question in the context of the slide. Now, um, this is an outline of what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to distinguish between records and reports. Um, and this is going to be very important, particularly in this area. Um, there is a new regulation from FDA about unique device identification. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, then we're going to uh, look at the scope of Part 806, which is where the corrections and removals regulations are. Um, and we're going to talk about who reports, uh, when to report, that's the report trigger, what to report, and how to report. Um, and then what we're going to find is that there are some cases in which I, um, you have to keep records, but um, you don't have to report to FDA. So we're going to discuss that as well. Then we're going to turn to our attention to this problem of recalls, um, because these reports you make to FDA are actually going to be classified as recalls. So we're going to talk about that um, in the new guidance document, uh, the draft guidance document from FDA. I'm going to mention it briefly. Um, and then uh, we'll do summary and open it up for questions and answers. So let's start by uh, looking at this issue of records and reports. Now, um, this is a quality management system. And in the uh, sort of uh, parlance that we, that we think about with FDA, um, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So records are very, very important, uh, particularly during inspections and audits. And so what we're going to do is look at records in particular. And we're going to characterize them in two dimensions. Um, the first dimension is the trigger. What activities cause you to initiate a record? In other words, um, what caused you to, what happened that you now say, oh, I've got to keep a record of this? And then the content. What kinds of information belong in the record? Now, very often um, there are prescribed elements, and we'll see that in this case in particular, um, in, in a record, as well as additional information that you want to you might want to keep because uh, it turns out to be important. Now, um, we're also going to look at two kinds of records. Um, we're going to distinguish between individual records. These are the records you create when you do um, a particular activity, an event, a situation causes you to create a record. These are going to be um, basically um, individual standalone records. But sometimes we also have to analyze um, and summarize specific records. So um, data analysis in ISO 13485 um, and in FDA, um, 
A20.100A1 is um, the data analysis portion that requires us to uh, analyze data. And so there, our data analysis is going to create what I'm going to call, because I don't have an, a good word for it, um, another word for it, rather, an, an umbrella record. So it's going to be a record that covers multiple individual records and summarizes information um, from those records. Now, on contrast to records, these are the things that we, that we keep for ourselves that demonstrate um, the objective, they provide the objective evidence that we follow the quality management system. Sometimes we have to tell the regulatory agencies that we've actually done something. And so I'm going to call that reporting. And I'm going to characterize reporting in three dimensions. Um, the first is the trigger. What activity causes you to make the report? Um, the second in, the, in reports is timing. Um, very often in these regulations, we'll find that you have a specific time frame from when the trigger occurs until the report is in the hands of the regulators, or at least the first version. Um, and so um, the timing is going to be very important. And again, the content, um, what kinds of things go into the reports. Now, we're going to look, not look at a lot of details, but um, we're going to look at overviews of, uh, of specific data elements that go into corrections and removals. We're going to see what's going on there. So there's a lot of, uh, of, of information along that line. Now, um, records and reports are um, fit together in a particular way. So uh, records provide the objective evidence that we've complied uh, with the regulations. Reports help keep the agency informed to um, perform its public health mission. And my suggestion here in this diagram is that reports are, in essence, some kinds of records. If you report something to the FDA, as an example, then you're going to keep a record um, that you have made that report. Sometimes um, the system is going to require both records and reports. Um, but um, there are cases in which you don't have to report, in which case you have to create a record as to why you didn't have to report. And we're going to see that in corrections and removals. If you don't, um, if you do a correction or removal and you have one of the exemptions where you don't have to tell FDA about it, you have to keep very specific records that include the reasons why you didn't have to tell FDA about it. And we'll look at that when we get to that um, section. Now, um, one of the things that is uh, relatively new is this um, problem of unique device identification. So that's often called UDI. And UDI is what's going to be on the label of a device. Um, and information on the label of the device is going to give you entry into a massive database that FDA is maintaining, um, which they are calling the Good ID database. Um, it stands for Global Unique Device Identification Database. Um, and so we're going to look at um, what's going on in there and some of the implications for corrections and removals. Now, here's the basic idea. The label of a medical device is going to uniquely identify um, the version or model of the device using something called the device identifier. And on a subsequent slide, I'll show you how this fits together. The device identifier is going to allow user access to a database, um, the good ID, um, that, allow, that contains specific information and attributes about the device. So if I know the device identifier, the idea is that I can go to the FDA's database and I can look up all kinds of information about that medical device in their database. Um, and so you as the manufacturer have to populate the information in the database. So you have to put some specific information on your label and you have to put some specific information into the database so that users can find it. And this is going to um, impact um, the, day, the uh, reports and records in corrections and removals. Now, here are the elements of the um, unique device identification. So there are, as, could be as many as uh, six different fields that are on the label. Now, um, we're not going to get into the details about unique device identification. So the easy way to think about this is this is on the label of the medical device. So um, I have a device identifier, and that always has to be there. It's a required element. Um, and there are five production identifiers. Um, they're optional elements. 
Um, but if you put them on the label, then you have to put them on the label in both human readable form and um, machine readable form. And those are lot numbers, the serial numbers, manufacture date, expiration date. Um, and if you um, have a medical device that involves human tissues, then you have an ID code that's associated with that as well. Now, um, you don't have to put the production identifiers on there, but if you do put, for example, a lot number on your label, then it becomes part of the UDI and you have to um, follow certain rules. There are also certain rules about the date format. Um, now, um, what this means is that you're going to, for every device identifier, that's going to be a, a version or model of the device, you're going to load the information into the FDA's um, database. Now, this is a little bit about what goes on with packages. This package is, this, this concept is going to extend upward um, from the device label to the package configuration. So if you have um, a device that's got one in a, one in a uh, container, um, then you're going to um, then sell them in boxes of five, then that box of five has to have um, its own device identifier. If you take that one device and you sell it as a standard configuration in a box of two, um, then that box of two has got its own device identifier. So you're going to grab a lot of device identifiers associated with the device in all of its standard packaging configurations. Um, slide 12 is going to take us in the other direction. In some cases, um, you have to um, directly mark the device itself. So in this case, you're going to put information on the device as opposed to on the device label. Um, and there are certain circumstances in which this has to happen, not for all devices, but that is going to potentially create a new device identifier, the, de the device identifier that's on the device, the device identifier that's on the label, and then the device identifiers that are on all the package configurations. So, uh, give, so you can have lots of uh, potential device identifiers um, to think about. Now, um, the good ID is the database that FDA is maintaining. Um, and it's got about 60 data elements in total. Um, some are required, um, some are conditional, triggered by um, specific entries in business rules. Um, and there's also a bunch of data elements, about six for every packaging configuration. Um, there's about 10 data elements that if you change them, they're going to require a new device identifier. Um, and so, you need, so as you implement uh, unique device identification, you need to think about all of these um, issues. Now, um, there's a partial list of data elements, um, and, and, this, and as I said, there could be as many as 60 different data elements. This is just going to give you a sense of some of the things that they're looking for. So the primary device identification number, this is the one that we talked about is on the label. Um, and that's going to be on the label of the, of the base package. Um, how many devices are in the base package? Um, so as, if I'm selling a catheter, I've probably got one device in each package. But if I'm selling gloves, I probably have 100 gloves in each package. So you have to know how many there are. Um, version of model number, um, package device identifier, if there's packaging configurations. Um, um, as an, another example is the device label for MRI safety. It's not required, but if you say yes, the device is labeled, then you have to fill in a whole bunch of fields that deal with, uh, with MRI safety. So that's one of the conditional um, elements. If you answer no, you're good. If you answer yes, there's about three or four more things to, uh, to fill in. So that's um, UDI, and it's going to be very important in understanding um, what's going on in the reporting because you're going to have to report uh, or keep records of some of these um, UDI elements as part of corrections and removals. So let's start with the requirement. Um, this comes in um, from uh, Part 806, and this is the, uh, one of the parts of the, of the regulation. And it's a not a very well-known part, and it's one of the reasons why I want to um, spend some time with this. So, uh, so what the regulation says is that this part is interested in implementing provisions of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, related to corrections and removals. Um, so if a company needs to report, the requirements are in 806.10, and we're going to go through them um, in a little bit of detail. Um, and they have to report promptly, which is defined in this case 
as 10 working days. Sometimes you don't have to report. You can do a correction or removal that's not reported to FDA. We'll talk about those exceptions. But then you have to keep a record as to why you didn't report. And so this record has a whole bunch of data elements, and they're in 806.20b. So um, there's a fair number of things that are going on in this, um, in this regulation. Now, um, here's the clause that was mentioned in um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So this is actually the, the law that um, regulates a lot of the things that FDA does. Um, and so um, I'm not going to go through this this in, um, in detail, but you'll notice in Section 1, it tells you about um, the kinds of things that need to get reported, and we're going to look at that in detail. Um, there, section 2 tells us that there, that there are cases in which you don't have to report. Um, if the corrective action removal is required, has been submitted under some other subsection, um, and um, corrections and removals do not include routine servicing. And so that's going to be one of the exceptions and flows down into the regulation uh, from the law. Now, um, what else is in this scope? Um, these are some of the exceptions, and we're going to look at these um, and in, in make sure that you understand what it means. So actions taken by the device manufacturer or importers to improve the performance or quality of a device but do not reduce the risk to health posed by device or remedy violations of, to the Act. Now, this is going to be very, very important because um, we're going to find that if you are improving a device but not to reduce a risk to health, you don't have to tell FDA about that. So that's going to be uh, one of the exceptions. Um, the second exception here is a market withdrawal, and we're going to explain what that means. Um, there's a technical term that FDA has defined. Um, routine servicing, we saw that in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, so that's the third exception. And then um, something called a stock recovery, um, and we'll, we'll define what a stock recovery means. So what, in essence, this tells us is that in order to understand what's going on and implement this regulation, you have to understand the requirements and also understand when you might have an exception and don't have to report. So we're going to um, look at that. Now, um, I've talked about corrections and removals. And so here are the definitions. Um, there's got to be a lot of defined terms here because we need to understand them in order to get the exceptions straight. But a correction means a repair, modification, adjustment, relabeling, destruction, or inspection of a device without its physical removal. So all of those things I just listed, um, if I um, do one of those activities without removing the device from its point of use, then it is a correction. If I do those essentially similar activities, but I take the device away from where it's being used, um, then that is classified as a removal, and FDA wants to know which ones you're doing. And you might, in fact, be doing both. So um, as an example, if you have a medical device um, in a hospital, um, and the hospital is relatively close to your factory, you might send somebody out to do the correction. But if the hospital has the same piece of equipment and it's really remote, or perhaps in a foreign country, um, and you want the device to be sent back to you, then the same activity would be classified as a removal. So you need to understand your strategy about um, where you're going to perform these activities. At the point of use, um, or are you going to physically remove it to some other place in order to perform the activities? That's going to be part of your strategy. Now, um, this diagram tells us a little bit about um, what's going on here. We're really interested in corrections and removals, and that's, what's, that's in Part 806. But they're related to a lot of other things that are going on in the quality management system. So the first one is a design change. Um, it's quite possible that you found a problem through complaints, you investigated in corrective action, um, and you decided to make a design change, um, and so you went back into the design um, control requirements in 820.30i for design changes, and decided that this design change needed to be implemented in um, 
items that were in the field. So that's going to result in a correction or removal, unless you have one of the exceptions. Alternately, you may have found that you have a defective uh, component um, and you need to change it in the field. You're not changing the design, but you found a problem with a particular part. So a correction, a corrective action could actually be triggering um, corrections and removals. Um, now, as I suggested, much of this starts with complaints. That's how you often find out about these problems. Sometimes complaints um, can be medical device reports as well. Um, and so I've included um, medical device reports in part 803. So um, very often these things are going to be triggered by complaints or perhaps service activities. And then a correction, a corrective action or a design change or both in combination could trigger the correction or removal. And that's what we're going to um, analyze. Now, um, the first thing we're going to get into is this issue of, re of reporting. Um, and so this is reporting to the um, regulatory authorities, FDA in this case. Um, there is corresponding um, things in uh, the European Union and, and Canada. Um, in the United States, they happen to be called um, corrections and removals. Um, who reports? Well, it's a manufacturer or an importer. Um, so you as a manufacturer or the importer have the obligation to inform FDA whenever you do a correction or a removal that isn't covered by one of the exceptions. Um, what triggers it? Well, when you decide to initiate the correction or removal. So initiation is going to be the starting um, activity. And unfortunately, uh, the regulations and the, and the draft guidance document don't define initiation. So you're going to have to do that in your own internal procedures. And then what's the time frame? Well, it's 10 working days. So from the time you initiate the report until FDA receives it, you have 10 working days. So working days excludes weekends and federal holidays. Now, um, what do you report? So um, what this regulation says, so this is 806.10, um, any correction or removal initiated by the manufacturer um, to reduce a risk to health or to remedy a violation of the act. The act is the Food, Drug, um, and Cosmetic Act. Um, and this is where the rule comes um, that you must have submit a report um, within 10 working days of initiating such correction or removal. So remember, working days is um, Monday through Friday. It excludes weekends and excludes federal holidays. Um, and not all holidays in the United States are federal holidays, so you've got to worry about that. Um, now, uh, what, re what triggers the report? Um, this is the decision to initiate a correction or removal. Um, now, there's um, some exceptions um, that we're going to talk about here. Um, one is that um, if you have filed a medical device report under Part 803, um, then and you filled in certain information in the MDR, then you don't have to duplicate that in the corrections and removals. But you've got to be careful um, because the MDR form doesn't necessarily have all of the um, blocks to prompt you to get all the information. Um, there's also a, a part of the regulations about um, electronic products um, where if they don't meet their performance requirements, then um, you can FDA can ask you to repurchase, repair, or replace them. Um, if you file reports under that section, you don't have to file the same report under Part 806. Now, um, there are exemptions as well. Um, you don't report if you only improve quality, um, market withdrawals, routine servicing, and stock recoveries. Um, and these are technical qualifications, so you need to understand uh, what's going on with them. Now. Um, What's the timing here? So uh, remember what it says is that uh, you submit any report required within 10 working days of initiating such correction and removal. Unfortunately, initiate is not defined in this part. Um, and so you have to decide what do you mean by initiate. Do you mean that you've made the decision to um, do the correction or removal? Does it mean that you've um, sent out the first kit? Does it mean that you've sent out a letter to the customer? You're going to have to define that. Um, and if you define it and you follow it, you're probably going to be okay um, with, with FDA. Um, now, the other um, MDRs, if you follow if an MDR, um, it actually requires you to report within five working days. So um, 
if you are initiating a change to something in the field. So um, there's a little bit of conflict here in the, in the timing. Um, now, what's in a corrections and removals report? So remember, this is what you're telling the regulators. So we're going to look at um, all of these data elements. Um, and we'll give you some idea about what goes in to make up each one. So we're going to um, we're going to look at all of we're going to look at these things in turn. So um, the first thing we're going to look at is the report number. So you have to structure the report number in a certain way. Um, your medical device manufacturing company um, or your importer has a registration number. So it's a seven-digit number. You know what that is because um, you have to include it in your annual. Um, registration, and so it forms part of the report number. And then the second set of things is the month, day, and year, and they've got to be in this format. Now, oddly enough, this is not the same date format as the um, um, unique device identification rule date format, but um, that's okay. Um, then um, you have a sequence number. Um, if you you could be doing more than one correction or removal on the same day. So if you are, the first one you report is number one, the second one is number two, and so on and so on. Um, and then you're going to dis, um, include an R or a C, depending upon whether you're doing a correction or removal. So as I had in an earlier example, you could actually be doing the same activity, but in some places it's a correction, some places it's a removal. It really depends upon how you're going to perform the activity, or I should say not how, but where, you're going to perform um, the activity at the site, or are you going to remove the medical device in order to perform the activity? Now, um, they want to know about your information. Who is the firm that's sending this thing in? So they want your name, address, and telephone number, and they also want to know who is responsible for making this happen. So um, this is basically going to be the contact person, so they want name, title, address, um, and telephone number for the contact person. So this is, um, and we're going to see some other information similar to this um, in a bit. Now, um, device identification, they want to know um, the name of the device, um, its classification name. So um, all medical devices are classified under the FDA regulations, and so you need to know um, what FDA called it in their classification system. Um, and then um, the usual name. You know, so you might have a brand name um, for your medical device, and so you call it one thing. Uh, FDA calls it something else in the broad classification scheme, and then um, it is a particular commonly available thing. That's going to be the usual name. Um, now, they want to know the intended use of the device. Um, and if you have this device, 510K or PMA, um, then you've um, stated an intended use when you got um, your um, sub when you made your submissions, be sure you use the same intended use. You don't want to change intended uses from what you've got FDA to approve because it's going to give you um, potential grief um, when the FDA um, next time you have an FDA inspection. Now, um, marketing status. Um, you're going to have one of um, three things: um, a pre-market notification number. Right, so this is going to be a 510K number, a pre-market approval number, um, or an indication that the device is a, is a, a pre-amendment device. Now, you may not have any of these things if it's a class one device that didn't require um, pre-market notification or pre-market approval. Um, a pre-amendment device means that it was legally, that you legally marketed the device um, before the FDA regulations changed and FDA was um, authorized to regulate medical devices. Now, you have to list all of your medical devices, um, and you um, update your registration and listing annually. Um, and so every medical device that you are involved with, you have to list, and so it has a listing number. So FDA wants to know uh, what that is. Now, um, this is the model number, and this changed as a result of the UDI rule. So um, you have to have a whole bunch of things. Um, UDI from the label, so we talked about that. That's essentially the device identifier. Um, UDI from the device package, again, um, you could have a different device identifier. Um, the device identifier, which is what we talked about, 
in some medical devices, um, you can use the uniform product code in place of the device identifier um, because that's going to uniquely define the device. So that's allowed under the UDI rule. Uh, model number, catalog number, um, or code number. And code um, here means part number. So um, in the FDA regulations, they often say code when um, most manufacturing people would say part number. Um, and then um, a manufacturing lot number or serial number or other identification number. Now, you don't always have um, those things, but um, you all, after the UDI regulation um, is, is fully implemented, you're always going to have a device identifier. So that's probably what you want um, to use. And that's what you want to start to write into your procedures, is that you're going to use the device identifier unless it hasn't, unless it hasn't been implemented yet because the rule is being phased in over time, in which case I'd recommend that you use um, the model number. Um, who's the manufacturer? Now, um, the manufacturer's name, address, telephone number, and a contact person. Um, and remember, um, the manufacturing site may be different than the reporting site. Now, um, if it's a small company, which is only one location, they're going to be the same. But if it's a large company, the reporting might be consolidated for say, at corporate headquarters for all manufacturing sites. And so there could be multiple manufacturing sites. So what site manufactured this as opposed to what site um, is doing the reporting? They're not necessarily going to be the same. So FDA wants to know um, both. All right, I'm having a problem with this moving slide. There we go. Okay, um, event description. Describe the events that give rise to um, the information reported. In other words, what happened that's causing you to um, do the correction or removal? And this is basically going to come out of your um, – I'm going to make the assumption that this started with a complaint. That's the way they usually do. And you did a complaint investigation. You probably did it in the corrective action system. Um, that's going to give you the information you need to describe uh, what happened. Now you're going to take actions as a result of that. Um, so what actions have you already taken? And um, there may be actions that you've planned that you haven't taken yet. What are they? So FDA wants to understand all of the circumstances surrounding the issues of what happened, what have you already done, and what are your, what are your plans um, in order to, uh, to complete all of these activities. Now, um, it's quite possible that there were illnesses or injuries that occurred from use of the device. Um, and so if there were, you want to describe them. And don't forget, um, if there were any injuries or illnesses, then you need to also file a medical device report, an MDR. So uh, the expectation is that you have, and so you need to include any MDR numbers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes um, you can report the corrections or removals as part of the MDRs, but you've got to be careful that the MDR contains all of the corrections and removals information as well. It's usually easier to um, do two separate reports. It may not seem like it on the surface, but in the end, um, it's going to keep you. It's going to keep things straight, and it's probably going to be um, more effective in order to get all this information correct to handle them as two separate reports. Um, how many? The quantity. Total number of devices manufactured or distributed and subject to the correction or removal. Now, um, you are supposed to, in the device history record, um, keep track of the number that you've manufactured and released for distribution. Um, in, um, there's another part of FEA QSR which uh, says that you have to keep track of, of who the original consignees are. Um, and so that's going to be um, perhaps the number um, that you've actually shipped. But um, manufacturer distributed, make sure it lines up with what your device history record data is, because it's one of the things the FDA investigator is going to check um, at the next time they do uh, an inspection of your firm. Um, the number of devices in the same lot or batch or unit of production subject to correction or, or removal. Now, um, date of manufacturer distribution. So. Um, you, they want to know uh, when you actually made this or when you actually shipped it. Um, and so, as I said here, um, 820.180B requires the design inspected life for record retention. So you need to be consistent. 
Um, and um, also you need to be careful um, that if you have an expiration date um, on the device or a manufacturing date or any of those other things, they're now part of the unique device identification. They're going to be on the label or the package as part of the UDI. So you want to make sure that you're consistent here. You're going to report the device identifier. The FDA investigator is going to go into the good ID database and they're going to check. So you need to make sure that you're consistent um, with, with all of this information. Now, who are the consignees? Um, they want to know um, the name, address, and telephone number of everybody who got the device, um, the number of devices distributed, and the distribution date. Now, you already have all these records. Um, if you have A20.160B implemented correctly, then you already have distribution records with the name and address of the original consignees, quantity, date shipped, any control numbers used, um, and so on. Now, oddly enough, um, this part did not get modified under unique device identification. So you don't have to record the um, device identifiers of anything that you shipped, but it's going to be in the device history record. So you've got an audit trail to track it back. So when you report the consignees here, go to your distribution records and make sure that you pick up the same data and it's consistent because, again, um, you're going to eventually get an FDA in, in, inspection and they're going to come and check. Um, communication, um, all communication relate regarding the correction or removal. Um, and so this means um, anything that you sent to the FDA, anything that you sent to your customers, it's all got to be part of this file. Um, and then the name and address of any recipient that's not on the list of consignees. Now, it could be that you know something about um, the next level in the distribution chain um, that wasn't one of your consignees, but you know that that person is getting the device. That's what they're after um, in, this, in this case. Um, now, this is all of the information you have to report, but sometimes you might not know it all, um, in which case FDA is asking you to identify any missing information, uh, why it was missing, um, and um, a statement that um, you're going to submit it when you, when you finally f figure out what it is. Um, and so um, you may be making an initial report subject to uh, follow-up reports if you have missing um, information. Now, who gets it? That's always a big question. Um, in this case, um, the corrections and removals go to the district recall coordinator. So um, in every district, there is a person appointed as the recall coordinator. Um, and there's a list on the FDA website that tells you who they are. Um, it's in a document that has the number UCM129334. And the easiest way to find it is to go to www.fda.gov and put this UCM number in the search engine box that's in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and you'll go to a results page, and then um, click on the results, and it'll give you the list, the current list of who the recall coordinators are, address, contact information, telephone numbers. Um, that's by far the easiest way um, to get your hands on uh, who you send the report to. Now, um, we're going to talk about some of these um, exemptions. Um, this is what is going on here. Um, the manufacturer doesn't have to report under certain conditions. And we've mentioned these, but now we're going to look at the um, explicit details. If you make a change to improve quality, and that's the only reason to make the change, right? not reduce the risk to health, but you're improving quality, um, then, you don't, then it falls under one of the exceptions. Um, if it's a market withdrawal, routine servicing, stock recovery, well, you've already covered it with all of the details under another report. And the typical place is, is in an MDR. So if you filed an MDR and it has all the required information for corrections and removals, you don't have to do a separate corrections and removals report. Now, I'm suggesting that you don't take that um, strategy simply because um, it's, it's too easy to miss information. It's much better to um, do the two reports separately and link them, and then you'll make sure you'll have everything that's going on. So um, actions, uh, so here's the improved quality exception. Um, the device manufacturer improves the performance or quality of a device, but doesn't reduce a risk to health or remedy a violation of the act. 
So um, you might have an improvement to a device, and you want to change the device in the field. Um, you're not making. This is really a question of your intention. Um, you don't know of a risk to health that's that's being reduced by making this change. Um, as far as you know, the device was manufactured in, in accordance with the um, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. In other words, you're not fixing a problem because you've got a manufacturing um, issue. Then um, it really does become a quality um, improvement, um, and you don't have to you don't have to report that um, to FDA. Now you have to keep records, but you don't have to report to FDA. Now, what's a risk to health? Um, it's defined here as a reasonable probability um, that use of this device is going to cause serious adverse health consequences um, or death or um, medically, temporary medically reversible adverse health consequences. So um, this is a low bar to health. Um, this is a much lower threshold than um, the re threshold required for medical device reports. So this is a case in which you could be reducing a risk to health but not have to file a medical device report. So those two things are not always going to be filed together. Another reason to have two separate systems and just make sure that they link correctly. Now, what's a marker withdrawal? Uh, correction or removal of a distributed device that involves a minor violation of the act um, that would not be subject to legal action by FDA or no violation of the act. Now, um, the second one is I feel much more comfortable with um, normal stock rotation. And so maybe what you have is a, is a device. It's got a shelf life. Um, and what you're doing is switching out the devices so that you make sure that the ones that are approaching their shelf life um, get used first. Or maybe you've got an agreement with a customer that um, if they don't use them all in a certain amount of time, um, and they expire, you're going to replace them and bring back the ones um, with shelf life. Maybe you can do something with them. Um, that's a market withdrawal. And those um, are normal stock rotation practices, so you don't have to report them. Um, the other one is uh, not involved a in minor violation of the act, not subject to legal action by FDA. I'd be very nervous about this because, in essence, what's happening is you're being asked to second guess whether or not you think FDA would take legal action um, against you. And um, legal action could be something as simple as a 483 or a warning letter. So um, it can also be much more extensive. But the issue here is that you don't want to put yourself in a uh, place of second guessing whether or not um, FDA would um, consider this to be a minor violation and um, not subject to legal action. So my recommendation is that you never um, utilize this part of the market withdrawal exemption, only normal stock rotations. You don't want to be second-guessing um, FDA. Now, routine servicing. Um, it means any regularly scheduled maintenance of the device, um, and they give some examples here. Um, calibration. So if you have to go out and calibrate a device, and calibration is usually periodic, um, if you have to replace batteries, and battery replacement is usually periodic, um, normal wear and tear, that's all routine servicing and doesn't get reported. So, um, but th there's a little caveat here. Uh, repairs of an unexpected nature, uh, earlier than normal life expectancy, or identical repairs or replacements on multiple units are not routine servicing. In other words, what they're suggesting is if you're starting to see a pattern in um, replacement of um, components or parts that you might be doing as part of servicing, um, and you start to see a pattern, um, then it could very well be that you've got a problem with the device, and that makes it reportable. And remember, you're supposed to be analyzing servicing data using statistical techniques. So that's in A20.200, and that's where you might discover um, this issue. Now, stock recovery. Um, it means the correction and removal of a device that has not yet been marketed or hasn't left the direct control of the manufacturer. Now, this is what could happen. Um, you um, go through all of the normal processes. You release a device for uh, a lot of devices um, for distribution. Um, and then you discover that there's a problem. You haven't shipped any of them. 
because you're still shipping out of the previous lot, but they're in your warehouse. They're, they're ready to go. They're in your warehouse. None of them have shipped yet, um, and you uncover a problem. Then you're going to say, oh, I'm going to take, take them back, and I'm going to go fix the problem. Um, they're in my warehouse. They haven't left my direct control. Um, then what this means is that um, that classifies as a stock recovery, not reportable. Now, you have to keep records of all of this stuff. Um, and so um, you're going to end up in the record-keeping side of this, but um, you, you can claim the stock recovery um, exemption. Now, we talked about these other reports. Um, if you have included all of the information in a Part 803 medical device report, an MDR, or a Part 1004 um, electronic products report, then you don't have to send in um, the corrections and removals report. But you've got to be careful. Um, MDRs is where you usually see this in medical devices, and um, the MDR form is not going to necessarily prompt you for all of the required information under corrections and removals. So again, um, my recommendation is two separate systems. Now, if you have any questions about using these exemptions, ask your district recall coordinator. Um, it's much better to answer the question early than to have it come up in an FDA inspection. Now, if you do contact the recall coordinator, leave a record behind. If you call that person, then um, take notes. Um, if you send that person an email and that person responds by email, that becomes part of the record of any communication. Um, make sure that you keep a record of that email. And it's really going to help you um, resolve any issues that might come up in, a, in an FDA um, inspection anyway. Now, we've talked about some things that don't get reported, so let's look at those issues. Um, so here's the requirement. Um, Every device manufacturer or importer who initiates a correction or removal that's not required to re be reported has to keep a record. So what this says is that um, if you initiate a correction or removal and you claim one of the exceptions, then um, you keep a record that you did the correction or removal and why it wasn't reportable to FDA. And we're going to look at what goes in, into, those, um, into those records. Now, um, basically, this is the requirement that goes, um, that goes into the records. And we're going to look at each one of those um, in detail. Now, um, there's a couple of things that we're going to look at that are going to be very important. Um, you have to have a designated person who is going to review um, the decision not to report. So um, this is going to be very important that you have that person identified and their qualifications and that the person satisfies the qualifications. There's a similar requirement in um, reviewing um, medical device reports and also in reviewing complaints. So very often it's going to be the same skill set and very often it's going to be the same person. So if you choose that path, just make sure that they're covered for all three um, activities, complaints, medical device reports, and corrections and removals. So make sure that you've got at least one person in your organization um, for each one of those three activities. Now, uh, what's going on here? Um, in, this is now the record that you're going to keep. So this does not get submitted to FDA. This stays as, in your company as a quality record. Um, and we're going to see a lot of the same things that we looked at before. So the device name. Um, and its intended use. So that's exactly what you would have put in the report. So it's, it's uh, exactly what we talked about. And remember, product code is part number in this case. Um, the model. Now, this got changed in the um, UDI rule. And so again, it's the same information that we saw um, in the report. Um, and my recommendation is that um, you make some decisions that if you have a device identifier, in other words, um, the rule has come into effect for your device, then utilize the device identifier. Otherwise, um, use the uh, model number. Um, and then um, if you have any of them, it's a manufacturing lot number, or serial number, or some other identification number. Um, so those are going to go into your um, record that you keep on site. On event description, um, essentially the same things. Describe the event that gave rise to the information recorded now, because remember, you're not reporting to FDA. 
uh, what actions have you taken and what actions do you expect to take? So in other words, you're going to write a short report describing what happened, what have you already done about it, and what are your future plans. Um, now here's where we start to see some differences. Um, the justification for not reporting. Um, and so you need to um, explain in your record why this was not reportable. And the reasons things are not reportable generally is that it falls into one of those four um, exceptions we talked about, stock removals, um, routine servicing, and so on and so on. Um, now, the justification has to contain any conclusions that you've reached and any follow-up actions that you're going to take. And then um, a designated person must review and evaluate the justification. Now, um, my recommendation is that wherever you find these designated persons in any parts of the regulations, designate that person in writing, define their competency because that's required by the quality management system um, in A20.25A, and maintain training records. Right? If they are trained in order to um, achieve the competency required, so this is a, a, essentially a job description, um, is going to define the competency, and so there are basic competency dimensions that are that are mentioned in in QSR. You're going to define the competency, and you're going to maintain the training records, um, and make sure that it covers the people that are handling medical device reports, and it covers the people that are handling corrections and removals um, records. Um, communication, all communication regarding the correction or removal. Now, you might have sent letters to customers, for example, so you need to keep a copy of all those customer records. You may have had a discussion with the uh, recall coordinator in the district office. That's communication regarding the correction and removal, so make sure it shows up in the file. And what you really want, in this case, is the recall coordinator to agree that um, there is no report required in your particular case. And so now you've got some really good evidence to show um, the FDA investigator the next time you, uh, that you have an inspection, because um, they're going to check this. It's part of uh, the things that they, that they look at. Now, um, record retention. You have to keep records um, for a period of two years beyond the expected life of the device, even if you don't manufacture or import the device any longer. Now, what this means is that you have established the expected life of the device. Um, and so there's a little disconnect here. Um, A20.80, that's quality system regulation, um, sets record retention period for QSR using the design and expected life of the device. And there's some, some rules. Design and expected life of the device or two years from um, when you um, ship the product, whichever is longer. Um, corrections and removals sets the record retention period at the expected life plus two years. So you need to be careful here. Your production records are going to have a different record retention period than your um, corrections and removal records. So um, you need to think about how you're going to set the record retention period um, when you need a production record to support a decision in corrections and removals. So you've got to watch these, this record retention period. Now, um, recalls. FDA is going to classify corrections and removals in general as a recall. Um, they're going to be classed as voluntary recalls. And um, FDA is going to classify recalls with a um, numerical designation, one, two, or three, depending upon the um, health hazard. And so um, here, the highest classification, in other words, the highest um, health hazard is a class one. So it runs backwards from the device risk classification. Um, so in the risk classification, class one device is the lowest risk. In the recall classification, class one device, class one recalls are the highest risk. Um, reasonable probability that the use of exposure to a violative product, and that doesn't mean a product that's purple, it means a product that violates the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, so that's going to be class one. Um, class two is temporary and medically reversible adverse health consequences. Now, you should recognize these as um, these are the classifications that we saw earlier in the definition of, uh, of risk to health that's in this part. This is no um, accident. Um, the definitions here were um, meant to align. Um, in the third case, 
situation in which use of exposure to a violative product is not likely to cause adverse health consequences. These are class three uh, recalls. And in general, if it's going to be a class three recall, it's not going to be subject to corrections and removals. So it, the things that have become class one and class two recalls are going to be corrections and removals um, that could get reported. Um, and so, uh, so, that, so there is a very strong uh, linkage between these two things, and it's done on purpose. Now, um, typically, therefore, corrections and removals are going to lead to class one or class two recalls. Um, and we talked about this um, business about the risk, definition of, of risk to health. It tracks these definitions. So corrections and removals are required for class one and class two recalls. Um, under Part 806, manufacturers and importers need not report events characterized as class three recalls, but you're still going to fall into the record keeping requirements. If you're going to change something in the field, or in um, that's the easy way to think about it, you either keep a record of why you didn't report or you report it. Um, now, how can you find out what's going on here? Maybe you're interested in what other people are doing. Um, and so um, FDA actually publishes this, as, publishes this as a public information. Um, so there is a document called the Weekly Enforcement Report. Uh, it contains all these enforcement actions, recalls, field corrections, seizures, injunctions, everything that's happened um, that um, FDA is going to report. And you can subscribe to this. Um, and I've given you the, the link um, where you can go read um, the weekly re enforcement reports. And it's going to cover drugs and devices and, and tobacco and all everything that FDA regulates. Um, but um, it's organized into sections, so you can easily get to um, the device um, section, and, uh, and you can find out what's going on. Um, and this is going to be very important um, for you, because you want to understand what's going on with other kinds of devices. Um, this is a source of information, um, for example, for your um, risk management system. Now, um, FDA published a draft guidance document about how to handle uh, corrections and removals. And there's a lot of controversy about this, and we're not going to go into um, the detail. But um, what they were trying to do is distinguish um, recalls, which are corrections and removals, um, from product enhancements. So remember, one of the things that's happening here is if you're improving the quality of the product and not, um, producing, and not reducing the risk to health, then um, it's not reportable. So that's a product enhancement. And, and FDA was worried that there are some companies that did not want to do product enhancements because um, they were afraid they were going to get classified as recalls, and that would give the company a, a bad name. Um, and so FDA wrote this guidance document in order to help people understand what the issues are. Unfortunately, um, there's a lot of comments about this uh, guidance document. It doesn't seem to have all of the issues um, correct. But um, what I've shown you here is um, one of the issues um, involving product enhancements. Um, so here's what it says. Um, if you've determined that the change is in product enhancement but not a recall, you have to report it under Part 806, right, under corrections and removals. So um, under Part 806, it says that um, uh, the report is required when a correction and removal reduces the risk to health. So as long as your change is not going to reduce the risk to health posed by the device, even if your change is not a recall, um, you've got to submit an 806 report um, unless all of the information has already been done um, someplace else. So some examples um, are the addition of a new warning to a device's label um, to reduce the risk to health, manufacturer's change of a sterile device to reduce likelihood of contamination, design change on a product safety profile. So um, the, the issue here is that recalls are violations of the act. Um, and so what it's suggesting here is that an 806 report submitted for product enhancements um, should be identified as such by the manufacturer. Um, and FDA says that if they agree, um, they're not going to uh, count it as a recall. So this is one of the big controversial um, issues because most people would have said this is going to fall under one of the exceptions 
and I don't have to report, um, make an 806 report to FDA. I just have to keep a record. So this is an example of one of these things. Now, this is a draft guidance document, and you don't have to follow it, but um, you need to understand um, that FDA might be changing their thinking about what all of this means. Now, uh, we're going to look at inspection um, issues. Now, um, there's a compliance program guide, and this is what helps FDA investigators understand what to look for. Um, so this is what they're told. Um, all failures to comply with corrections and removals needs to be listed on the 483. Um, once the investigator has confirmed with the district recall coordinator that it's going to be a class one or class two recall situation. So what's going on here? Um, what's going on here is that um, the investigator is going to come in, they're going to look at corrections and removals, and they're going to see whether or not you should have reported. Um, and then they're going to go call the, the uh, district recall coordinator if they've got any questions. So um, this is one of the cases in which would, it would be really valuable that you check with the district recall coordinator in advance, um, keep a record of um, what happened, um, and um, decide whether or not it's going to be a class one or class two recall based upon what the recall coordinator said. If it is, you're going to have to report. But what you're hoping for is that you don't have to report, and you've got objective evidence that you've discussed it with the recall coordinator, and you can show that to the um, FDA inspector, um, and that should resolve the problem. Um, now, um, the district, it says here, should consider a warning letter when um, there are violations of corrections and removal. So this is, think of this as any corrections and removal violations are going to be an automatic warning letter. Um, so one of the things that's suggesting is that um, you didn't file the report within 10 working days of initiating a corrective action. Um, the um, issue here, of course, is that initiation is not defined. So it's a, a big issue about exactly when the clock starts. So m my recommendation is that you make a reasonable definition in your procedures about when the clock starts, um, and you should not have an issue with the FDA. Um, if you've got a reasonable expectation of when it starts, and then you file all the reports within um, 10 working days. Now, um, repeat violations is the last bullet. When the firm has already received a warning letter and doesn't comply, then the district should consider uh, civil money penalties or prosecution. So, in other words, if you've already got a warning letter, and then you get a subsequent inspection and they find the same kinds of issues, they're going to escalate it. The compliance program guide is telling the FDA um, investigators and the, and the district office, um, go escalate. Start charging them money or prosecute um, the officials in the company for these violations. These are serious. Um, and this doesn't show up in all of the other areas in the program compliance guide. Now, when the FDA investigator comes in, they're going to look at corrections and removals as part of the quality system inspection technique. Um, so here are the inspectional objectives um, that they're going to look at. Um, determine if corrections and removals of a device were initiated by the manufacturer. Now, how are they going to do that? Well, you re if you did initiate them um, and you reported them, then they are going to um, have the records in the district office. So if you've already reported one, they're going to know about it. Um, how about the ones you didn't report and, um, and sh um, should have? Well, they're going to check to see whether or not you have kept the appropriate records. Um, and what about the ones that you should have kept a record or you should have reported and you didn't keep a record? Well, they're going to find them because they're going to go through corrective actions. They're going to look at complaints. They're going to look at a variety of things, and one of those um, documents could lead them to say, oh, you know, it looks like you informed the customer about this or you got that particular information. That could be a correction or removal, and they're going to pursue that. So you need to make sure that you have all of your um, documents and records um, straight in this area. Um, confirm the firm's management has implemented the reporting requirements for Part 806. So um, oddly enough, Part 806 does not require you to have written procedures. Almost every other part of the regulations do. Um, but you should have written procedures, and that's how you're going to implement the reporting requirements. So you should have, as part of your standard package, um, how to report 806 
corrections and removals. The next bullet point is um, verify the firm is established and continues to maintain a file of non-reportable corrections and removals. So you should have a procedure that tells you how to do this so that you do it consistently. So you're going to have a procedure that tells you how to report and a corresponding procedure that tells you when not to report and what to keep for records. Um, and so verify the firm is complying with the other file-related requirements in Part 806. So, um, you know, all of your record retention requirements and so on and so on. So even though Part 806 does not require you to write procedures, um, my recommendation is that you um, have written procedures and you're going to get this implemented consistently um, and in include checklists to make sure that you've got everything covered. Um, now, we're going to look at some warning letters. Um, and I find warning letters um, instructive because um, it's not so much that I'm interested in uh, the particular firms we're going to name. I'm interested in what we can learn um, from the warning letters. So the, um, the warning letters are, are uh, going to give us some in indications about what FDA um, investigators are finding. Um, so here's an interesting one. Failure to provide all the required information uh, when you reported your correction and removal through a MedWatch report. Um, now, the MedWatch report is the MDR form. So specifically, um, the information required in uh, this part of 806, um, it should be noted that your firm's field action was reviewed by FDA and determined to meet the threshold of a Class II um, recall. Um, and, and so apparently what's going on here, um, as it says in the second paragraph, um, the correction of this problem was reported to the FDA, but it didn't contain all the required information regarding the consignees contacted in the correction. Um, during the inspection, the quality manager provided a list, right, so that's good news. But then, um, this is why I like this warning letter, the quality manager stated he was unaware of the corrections and removals reporting and record keeping requirements. So this came as a surprise to the quality manager of a medical device company that um, this part of the regulation existed. So the thing to learn here is that you need to make sure that you understand um, everything that's in this part of the regulation, that you've got it implemented in procedures, and that you're keeping all of the required records. So you need to go just check that all that stuff is there. Now, um, in this one, failure to submit a written report initiated to remedy a violation of the act. Your firm failed to report a correction and removal of patient monitoring component in order to reduce known incidents of some kind of failures. The failure mode may present a risk to health and must be reported as a correction or removal. So here they were fixing a component um, in a medical device. And um, so it probably came as a result, I'm assuming, um, just because this is the normal way it happens, they probably got a complaint. Um, they investigated the complaint through the corrective action process. As a result of the corrective action process, they realized that they had a problem with the component and decided to fix the ones in the field. Uh, probably not a design change involved here, um, but as soon as they decided to fix the ones in the field, um, they fell into the corrections and removals, um, Part 806 requirements, and apparently they did not um, get them implemented correctly. Um, now, here's a very interesting example. Your correction to apply a software patch um, for this problem of non-identifiable patient information added to the correct in, um, incorrect file was not reported to FDA. A letter describing this issue was sent to customers, and the patches became available on a certain date. Now, the reason I like this um, is that this illustrates one way in which FDA finds out um, about these things. Um, this company sent a letter to its customers. And there's a good chance that um, the letter to the customer went to a competitor. I don't know this for sure, but this is usually what happens. Went to a competitor. The competitor went to FDA and said, um, this company is um, got a problem in the field, and you should check it out. And FDA would then go and say, all right, do we have a record of correction or removal that corresponds with this letter that the company is sending to its customers, and apparently not. And so as a result, um, FDA probably went in and did an investigation, sorry, did an inspection, and um, discovered that um, 
this was not reported to FDA, even though the company sent um, letters to its customers. So the lesson to learn here is that if you send a letter to your customer saying, uh, in effect, we've got a problem and we're going to fix it, we're going to take care of you, make sure that you report that to FDA as a correction or removal um, because they're going to get their hands on those letters and they're going to come and ask. All right. Um, um, this company um, conducted a partial removal of three lots of these blankets from the market. The information was not reported um, to FDA within 10 days. Um, so they responded to the 483, um, and FDA said that the response is not adequate. Um, you've sent a recall notice to all customers. You're providing required um, information. However, you did not provide any information or documentation to demonstrate this violation will not recur. In other words, um, this company reported to F um, got caught in the inspection. Um, they responded to the 483, and they said, we're going to take care of it. But what they did not include in their response is, what actions are they going to take to keep this problem from happening again? And that's one of the things that FDA is interested in. If they, just, they want more than just that you fix the immediate problem they've uncovered. They want to make sure that you've got activities in place to make sure that it is not going to happen again. So that's very, very important in these cases. Um, all right, now, um, a failure to provide justification for not reporting. Um, so here's the case. Your contract manufacturer reworked a bunch of devices um, in 2012 and 2013 to correct some issues. Um, there's no record of a written justification for not reporting the correction to FDA. Um, and so what happened was this company um, sent these things back to the contract manufacturer um, to get them fixed. So this is probably a removal, um, although it does say correction. Um, and um, they were fixed by the contract manufacturer. The company never reported to FDA. So the company that's putting the device on the market is the company that's responsible for reporting to the FDA, not the contract um, manufacturer. Um, the um, corrective action did not include a description of the events giving rise to the information. Um, and uh, what they're asking for is a health risk assessment um, as we Required by this company's own action plan. So the company said they were going to do a health risk assessment as part of their action plan, and apparently they didn't do it. And FDA is saying, well, you said in your procedure you were going to do it. We want a copy. All right, summary and conclusions. Um, for every record, um, you need to maintain um, a record of every change to any device in the field. Um, and for the records, see, remember these are the things you're not reporting, include the reasons not to report. And be sure to identify any exemption. So if that's what's going on, make sure that your records are complete. And also they're reviewed by a designated individual. In other words, all of the requirements for a record, you're going to make sure um, that you've satisfied them. You're going to develop a checklist and make sure that all the required elements are in every record. If you have to make a report, if you have to make a correction or removal, and it doesn't fall under the exemptions, then report it. So report when required every correction and removal. Make sure that all of your reports have all of the required documentation. And you're probably going to have associated documents as well. You're probably going to have a complaint. You may have a service record. You may have a correction and an, um, corrective action record. You may have a, a, a design change record. Make sure that they all link. Um, and so what's really important here, though, is that uh, you have made all of the required reports um, to FDA. Now, um, you need to um, look at this every time you change a product um, and anything involving the product, labels, information manuals, provide clarifying information. Any of those things might um, trigger a correction or removal. Um, you need to evaluate the risk to health of the change. So. All of your change control activities for uh, corrective actions and for um, product designs need to evaluate um, whether or not um, you're making these changes. Are they going to result in field actions? And if so, um, are they reportable? So you must either, um, if you change anything in the field, either file a report with the FDA or keep a record as to why you didn't need to file. And remember, 
um, very often corrections and removals are going to be associated with an MDR. If some, if the, if the uh, somebody got hurt or injured or potential for injury, that's going to require an MDR. It may also require correction or removal. You need to make sure the systems talk to each other um, and that everything links. All right, so um, that's the presentation. I'm going to turn it back to our host, who will uh, explain to you how to ask questions. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for Dan, uh, like you said, you can go ahead now. What you could do is if you want to directly put forward any verbal questions for Dan, you could uh, click on the raise hand option, which is a palm-like icon on your participant screen. That way you can go ahead and unmute your lines and you can directly put forward your questions for Dan. Or you could use the chat column or the Q&A panel to send in your questions. So if you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, Dan today, please go ahead. And also, I'd like to remind all our participants that uh, if you do come up with questions at any time after today's session, you can send in your questions directly over to us, and we'll make sure these questions are forwarded to Dan to get you your answers. So if you have any questions for Dan, ladies and gentlemen, please go ahead. Uh, Dan, I don't see any questions coming up. I'll just give it uh, an extra 20 seconds to see if we do have any questions here. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, just want to remind you all that today's webinar is available in a recorded format. So if you feel that any of your friends or colleagues would benefit from today's session, you can have them log on to our website at globalcompliancepanel.com. We have a dedicated web page on our website for our speaker, Dan O'Leary. So you can go through the topics uh, from the past. Dan's got a lot of topics from the past as well, so you can uh, choose which are topic is applicable uh, and the one you're looking for, you can make a purchase as well or you can give us a call as well, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, also just want to remind you all that the feedback form is open in the polling area, so please share your feedback on today's session. We have just over eight questions and they're all multiple choice in nature, so it shouldn't take you more than a couple of minutes to go ahead and share your feedback. Uh, Dan, I don't see any questions coming up, so we'll go ahead and conclude the session before we do any final thoughts. Okay. Well, um, well, thank you all for, uh, for attending, and um, as I said, it's very important that um, you recognize your obligations to report, the FDA is going to be checking, and that you make all of your systems um, talk to each other so that you um, cover all of the linkages between uh, corrections and removals and all of the other parts of the system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I thank you all for participating. And before you go, please share your feedback in today's session. And if you have any suggestions or questions on today's topic as well, please make sure to get in touch with us. You have our information on screen and on the handouts you received as well. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of speaker, Mr. Dan O'Leary, and the entire Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you all and hope the rest of the day is a lovely one. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you so much, Dan. Thank you.